And welcome everybody to another episode of Tennis Channel Inside In on the Tennis Podcast Network. Mitch Michaels here still rolling along into the tennis season with Wimbledon behind us, the Olympics coming up, and the summer hardcourt season on deck. Joined this week on the show by Steve Weissman, who's anchored and covered coverage on Tennis Channel for over six years now, becoming a true OG in the game and uh, also working for NFL Network. Coming uh, by way of Northwestern, originally D.C., Steve, thanks for making the first official appearance here on Tennis Channel Inside In. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Money Mitch. I mean, uh, you know, you, I know you've been doing this for a while and uh, I'm super happy for you. Proud of you getting this Inside In podcast and uh, honored to, to finally be a guest here. This is a long time in the making uh, for sure. And uh, I know that, you know, the last year has been has been tough on a lot of people. The the ability that we've shown, I think, as a company to kind of adapt. And this is coming off of Wimbledon where everybody was here, you know, in California. We were doing the production here and you were anchoring a lot of the coverage for that. And the first thing I realized with that was just how deep our roster are, seeing every our talent roster is seeing everybody in the same hallway for the first time in a Grand Slam. You get to really appreciate just all the minds and all the talent. Much like yourself, of course, that were a part of the team that brought Wimbledon two weeks, you know, nonstop. Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, it's amazing. I, we, we've got more Hall of Famers than any other, you know, tennis network in the world. Um, it's a true privilege to, to walk those halls, Mitch, because, you know, you're, whether it's Martina Navratilova, Lindsay Davenport, Jim Curry or Tracy Austin, uh, Pam Shriver's with us now. And, um, you know, having those minds, that Hall of Fame experience, obviously, Chanda Rubin, I work with a ton and she's amazing. And just all the folks, Paul Anacone, um, John Wertheim, who's such a great writer and mind as well. And to have all those voices, plus, you know, Hall of Fame play by players and guys like Ted Robinson, who I grew up, you know, listening to and is uh, just such a pleasure to, to hang out with and, and kind of get to know on a personal level. So, uh, I'm, I'm super grateful to be a part of, I, I call it a family at, at Tennis Channel because, you know, from the top down, it, it feels that way, you know, from, from Ken Solomon to Bob Wiley and Ross Schneiderman. It's just, it's a place that, um, you know, I, I've never been at a place or a network or, or a place of work that really is, is so positive overall and is always giving you know, good feedback. And when we're there, you know, at four in the morning, Bob's there, Ken's there, you know, obviously Ross is there as well. So, um, you know, they're, they're on those same grind hours that we are, and it's all part of the, part of the process putting, you know, we're, we are the network of record for our sport. And, um, you know, we take that really seriously and, and we're very proud of it. Let me think of something else too. You know, you've been doing this for six years, but following the sport your whole life. And, and obviously, knowing more about it than most people. But just when I'm watching, let alone when you're working with these people, but when I'm watching Jim Courier, Lindsay Davenport, Martina call match, I still feel like I'm learning something. And I get, yeah. and I would venture to say you feel the same way, you know, within the matches, within the segments that you're still learning from some of the greatest minds to ever be involved. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you never stop learning. And, and especially when you're, when you're around such greatness. Right. And, you know, I, I played tennis for like an hour and a half this morning. I actually hit with, with Tracy and her brother, Jeff, yeah. Yeah. um, the other day, uh, at her club, the Jack Kramer club up in rolling Hills. I mean, it's, it's those type of experiences that to me are, you know, priceless. I mean, and then, so we, we played the, these games, um, two on two basically for like an hour and a half, two hours. And uh, Tracy's so good. I mean, I mean, her brother, you know, played at Wimbledon and played doubles with Jimmy Connors. Now he's like a super agent and, um, and he's amazing. And so after that, you know, Tracy's like, I, I want you to stay. I want to, I want to give you a lesson. <laughs> I, I want to work on your forehand. I want to work on some volleys. I'm like, yes, okay, I will stay yeah, here as long yeah, as you twice, want. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and it, it was one of the best workouts I've had in weeks. I mean, I was, I was drenched. It was three hours of just grinding on the court. And, but, but those are the things that are, they're amazing. You know, those are our priceless memories and things that I don't take for granted. And, um, you know, being, you know, growing up with tennis and playing my entire life and, and now calling, you know, these folks, friends, um, and, and family is, uh, it's amazing, Mitch. It's still pretty surreal for, I think, all of us to just walk the hallways and just, you know, come into contact and conversation with uh, these people. 
Another important part of tennis growing up, as I'm sure for you as me, was the Olympics and getting ready for uh, the big event every four years. It took us five years since the last one with the delay last year, but Olympics in Tokyo, uh, the tennis tournaments are about to get going there. And I think we do have to address the fact, Steve, that it is different. There's a lot of players that have decided to pull out for a lot of different reasons, and understandably so. There's the COVID situation in Japan, which is not great. It's still an important event and an important experience for a lot of players. But I think this year, it kind of does put things into perspective that you have to make decisions what's based on what's best for you, your family, and uh, it's understandable why players would pass. I don't think a lot of us realized that in the past before, but you know, going into this Olympics, do you feel like it still has the same level of buzz, the same level of excitement? How would you gauge what you're going into this Olympics feeling? So I think the Olympics in general, when I grew up, was one of the biggest events on the planet. And it was something that I truly looked forward to every four years. I knew the names of the swimmers and the gymnasts and the speed skaters and the skiers and, you know, whether it was slalom and and the bobsledders and and the track stars, everybody, right? I mean, it was a big deal. Um, I was just talking the other day about growing up with Dan Johnson, Dan O'Brien, you know, with the decathlon and they were on the cover of Wheaties and it was such a huge uh, push going into the Olympics. And I can't tell you who our best decathlete is this year for the U S now. I mean, you know, Katie Ledecky for swimming, Simone Biles, obviously. And I know all the tennis players and, and, and the basketball players um, and, and a variety of others as well. But um, I think the Olympics in general is not, doesn't carry the cachet that it once did just because of cable television, because of the fact that you can watch all these sports if you want to on a very consistent basis. Um, But it's still a big deal. And, you know, personally, I got to do play by play for the Rio games five years ago. That was a dream of mine. You know, I grew up, I was like, it's a dream to work the Olympics and, and to be a broadcaster for the Olympics. And that's something that I'll, you know, treasure for the rest of my life. So if you're an athlete, and this is your first opportunity to go, if it's Tokyo, I don't know if you're passing that up. Um, and, and most of the top tennis players are going, by the way. There are, there are some exceptions, but in general, most of the top tennis players are going. I think when it comes to the big three, there were decisions to be made. And, you know, I spoke to, to Roger in both Paris and then covering Wimbledon. And when he told me that the situation at Wimbledon was terrible when it came to the bubble and not being with his family, that said a lot to me. And so at that point, I was like, you know, he's probably not going to Tokyo. Same thing with Rafa. I mean, he's so close with his family and his team and the restrictions on the amount of people you can bring with you um, is, is a lot different this year. But for Novak, he's going for history. And that uh, trumps all of that. And so the ability to be the second human on the planet to win a golden slam um, is, is something that I think pushed him over the top and, and motivated him to go to Tokyo, to be able to, to chase that history, win Tokyo and then set up New York and the U S open for, you know, what would be the first man to, to ever accomplish this. And he is a guy that knows history, knows the stats and, and wants to be, uh, the greatest of all time. If he wins a golden slam, man, I mean, it's tough to, yeah, tough to, tough to say he's not. So, um, you know, I, I'm excited for the, for the tournament, you know, be also being able to carry that flag for your country. I think, you know, Rafa called that an unbelievable moment. Andy Murray said, you know, that was the proudest moment of his career. Marcos Bagdadis, when he did it for his country of Cyprus, said it was the best moment he'd ever felt. And, and this year, Petra Kvitova gets to do it for the Czech Republic, Elena Ostapenko gets to do it for Latvia. And I think that's something that is unique and special. And you don't even get that at the Billie Jean King Cup. You don't get that with Davis Cup, you know, because you're around all the greatest athletes on the planet and you're walking out and, and, and carrying that flag. I can't imagine, you know, how, how proud and, and the goosebumps that they feel. Yeah. Kvitova just said she couldn't believe it. Like she was dreaming when she saw that she got selected. And uh, yeah, I mean, the thing with tennis and you could throw basketball in there, obviously that these are sports where you have, it's not pure amateur athletics. You have a career, you have the ability to earn a lot of money outside of it, which other Olympians don't have, but 
all the tennis players, like you said, decide to play this event. So that shows you just how important everything is. Djokovic obviously knows history, knows what's at stake for him this year, knows what a gold medal would mean. It's like the last box left for him to check off on his resume. And he would not be making this trip just to, I mean, as much as he loves playing for Serbia and he loves the pride that gets out of there, he's not going just to show up. Like He's not going to do anything but win. No, absolutely. And, and I remember calling the Rio games and when he lost to Juan Martin Del Potro, he was devastated. I mean, he was literally in tears. I had never seen him, you know, that dispirited and crestfallen for something that happened on a tennis court. And I think coming from one of those countries, I think it's, it's no matter where you're from, but, you know, being from Serbia, um, you know, a small country that has, you know, gone through a lot and he's gone through a lot and to be able to represent them and, and to be able to, you know, want to, to perform your best in an individual sport when it's more than just you, it's for your entire nation. I think that's an extra pressure that a, a lot of tennis players don't feel on a regular basis. And, and I think it's something that, that is special. And, uh, you know, he's been putting out a lot of stuff on social media meeting other athletes. And that's something else that's really cool that, you know, if you're a top tennis player and then you get to meet, you know, all the basketball players and the gymnasts and all these, you know, global icons that you yeah. normally wouldn't run into ever, <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe at the ESPYs or something like that or, or an award show, but, but this is the only time when they're all together. Um, and, and I think that is a truly unique and special experience as well. I still remember 2012 Olympics when the USA basketball team was, uh, they didn't get great seats. They were kind of up in the upper deck for Usain Bolt running, but they yeah. had to be there for that moment. Um, no, I, I think it's cool, obviously, on a lot of levels. Uh, Blair Henley wrote an article on tennis.com talking about the importance of certain players. You read about Allie Risk, who dreamed about this moment, thought it was taken away, and you know finally gets it realized. Players like Anj Jabor, who represent a, a region of the country that never you know, thought that they would see great tennis players as well. And I actually thought of all people, um, Jack Sox quote about how the gold medal is probably one of the first things you're going to show to your family who doesn't understand you know, what a Masters 1000 level tournament is necessarily. So even though it's you know, for pride and you're not going to get the money or the ranking points out of it, this is still a, uh, an unbelievable event and an opportunity for a lot of players to cement their legacy even further. No, that's a great point. Uh, and, and I found that interesting because Sam Query had a quote in that, in that same piece, great piece by Blair Henley, that he would rather win a Masters 1000 than, than go to the Olympics. And then you got Jack Saku saying, you know, years from now, that'll be what I remember most. And, and I think that's true when you're talking to somebody in general and you say, I won a gold medal or I won, you know, Indian Wells they're going to know what the gold medal means. Although if you're talking to somebody who's into tennis, they'll probably be mm -hmm. like, I don't know. Indian Wells is a pretty big deal. Um, maybe you compare it to a major. I, I would compare it to a major um, just because, but, but then again, you know, I, I personally, I don't know how you feel. I would personally rather win Wimbledon than win a gold medal. I'd rather yeah. win, you know, the U S open. I would probably, I mean, I'm, I think we're maybe a little biased here. Uh, being in the tennis thick of it, definitely Wimbledon, definitely the U.S. Open. The other two, I'm not sure, and that's no slight on the other two tournaments, but it's always for a certain demographic of us, Wimbledon, U.S. Open, were kind of what we associate with tennis. You could disagree. I would, I would say all four, and this is why, yeah. Mitch, because yeah. if I'm trying to get into the Hall of Fame mm -hmm. and I won a gold medal and was ranked number one but had no majors, I'm not getting in. But if yeah. I was ranked number one, have a major title to my name, there's a chance I'm getting in. There's players that have gotten in with that, yeah. but the gold doesn't, doesn't make you a hall of famer in our sport. Winning majors is what it's all about. That's what makes you a hall of famer. So I, I put more weight um, on that. I mean, you know, listen, a gold medal has made Monica Puig's career and that, you know, what she was able to do for Puerto Rico. I mean, that's incredible. And Nicholas Massu, what he did, you know, winning two gold medals for Chile. I don't think he's going to be in the hall of fame. Mm -hmm. But if he had won two Wimbledons, <laughs> yeah, you know, that gold medal would look good <laughs> in that display case, though, right on the mantle. Just people walk in your house, see a gold medal. But I agree with most of what you're saying there. Um, there are a lot of opportunities here, uh, as as we mentioned in this in this draw, that Andy Murray, a two-time defending gold medalist champ, the women's champ, is not in it. Monica Puig, 
So opportunity for Ash Barty, Naomi Osaka in front of yeah. the country. And it's best of three format, which we know on the men's side could lead to some more parody and unpredictable results. But how do you see this shaking out some good popcorn matchups early? Yeah, some great, some great matchups. I, I, I still favor Novak. Um, like I do at any tournament that he is entering in currently. Um, but I would love to see, you know, some great performances from the Americans. I'd love to see Francis Tiafo make, make a nice run. I, I think on the women's side with, with Jen Brady, um, Jesse Pagula, you know, obviously Ali risk is, is fully healthy right now. And I think this is, this is going to be interesting for Naomi Osaka with just with everything that she has been dealing with over the past few months. Um, you know, this, this is it, you know, it's Tokyo, it's in Japan. Uh, a lot of her, you know, the past few years has been geared toward the Olympics and it was supposed to be last year. Um, so just to see her on a court, you know, for the first time in a while, I'm looking forward to, cause I, I love to watch her play, um, for Ash Barty. I think, you know, it, it's pretty amazing as well. Just her, her journey and not, you know, going home for basically nine, 10 months after leaving Australia in February um, and to be able to produce the results she's been able to do. So, you know, I, I, I think it's wide open, as you said, because two out of three on the men's side, um, it's always kind of wide open on the women's side. Um, and that's a good thing. I, I think it'll make for, for a fun event. Yeah. I'm, I'm always intrigued by what we see at the Olympics and all the sports, let alone tennis. And the last thing I had to bring up is just the memories of this tur- of tournament in the past. 2012 will always be the one I look at as you saw Serena's dominant performance in the final over Sharapova. It was played at Wimbledon, so that's a, yeah. you know, a unique event too. And I know Murray won the tournament, but a lot of us won't ever forget Federer Del Potro in the semifinals and just that third set that would not end. And another match, yeah. I, I think Kobe was actually at that one too. Was he? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I remember Murray just because he had lost to Federer Mm-hmm. you know, um, at Wimbledon that year. And this was like a few weeks after that, I think, not that long after that. And to be able to win on that court and then propel him to then become a major champion after that and eventually, you know, win Wimbledon um, is something, you know, that, that I'll never forget. And then honestly, Rio to me is, is the most memorable just because I was such a big part of that. You know, the other Olympics, I'm working, I'm covering whether, you know, back in the day it was on Sports Center or NFL Network or Tennis Channel. Um, you know, tennis, while it was one of my favorite sports growing up, Olympic tennis wasn't um, because, you know, to me, the, the four majors are the big deal. So I was interested in, in watching the gymnasts do their thing, the water polo players, the swimmers, Michael Phelps. I mean, that, that, that was all a bigger deal to me than Olympic tennis. Um, but 2016... And I was all in and it was awesome. And seeing Juan Martin Del Potro, you know, make the run that he did was really special to watch. Steve Weissman on Tennis Channel Inside In on the Tennis Podcast Network. Well, you mentioned the Hall of Fame and how hard it is to get in for a lot of players. The Hall of Fame had their ceremony this year. Uh, They had the tournament as well. But uh, I wanted to just start with the uh, induction ceremony, seeing Conchita Martinez and Goran Ivanisevic. One of the first memories of me paying attention to tennis, like a run, was that even Isovich Wimbledon final that essentially made him a Hall of Famer. And uh, I just, I was very, very happy to see them finally get their day after a year where it was delayed. Uh, some great speeches and just some great reverence for the Hall of Fame itself. You know, Newport, Rhode Island, just being the perfect place, it seems like, for, for everyone to convene and just has the right mood set and the right vibe for the Hall of Fame. I really believe that. Yeah, I, I miss being there. You know, um, the last few years we, we've been there and I love that place. I mean, having worked, you know, at ESPN in Connecticut, I was like two hours from Newport and that would be a place that I went to, you know, for to get away for a weekend and then finding out about the International Tennis Hall of Fame and walking through those gates with, in basically it's like a strip mall. And then you walk in and you're like, oh, my God, this is tennis heaven. And there's these grass courts and it's, you know, then you see the museum and it's, it's like nothing you'll, you'll ever, you'll ever see. Um, It's beautiful. And, you know, Todd Martin's done such a fantastic job as the CEO there, fellow Northwestern Wildcat, go Cats, Um, Stan Smith as the president there. I mean, they do a wonderful job with the tournament. 
and and with, with just you know promoting the sport of tennis as an international tennis hall of fame and um also there's great great food in newport rhode island but but i i love the speeches this year too i thought it was a, a fantastic event uh you know our colleague brett haber did a wonderful job as always as the mc and i thought conchita's speech was was wonderful goron really paying tribute to the original nine and conchita was magnificent but to me it and dennis Van, vandermeer by the way legendary coach i i grew up knowing you know you knew Vandermeer and you knew Boletari if as as a kid my age and you know those were the two that you were you know wanted to go to and and become a star um but to me it was all about the original nine uh, you know I think long time coming the original nine has has transformed not only tennis I mean what they've done for all women's sports in general you know it is is transcended and um I love the speeches of Valerie Ziegenfuss. I love uh, Julie Heldman's speech. Um, you know, BJK is, is BJK. You know, she's the king. Um, and, and I love Rosie. And, and just, just to see seven of the nine there, um, another one, you know, in Australia, Judy Dalton, you know, be able to give a speech as well and, and hear from all of them. Because a lot of times we do hear from Billy and, and, you know, I'll listen to Billy all day long, seven days a week, you know, 24 hours a day. But to hear from Valerie and and Julie and their stories, it, it meant a lot to me. And and the original nine deserve all the accolades and more. And so that that was the most special part of the weekend for me. Yeah, Billie Jean King, it's it's like gospel, essentially. Whenever she talks, everyone just stops and pays attention, which is how it should be. But no, it was uh, it was a tremendous, tremendous honor for the original nine. I agree, a long time coming. And then next year we get Leighton Hewitt. So that'll that'll usher in a new generation that yeah. doesn't seem like it was too long ago. But um, the tournament, he, he's itself, still like playing some doubles, right? I mean, like he's not he's still done. <laughs> he's playing. I don't think he's ever going to, you know, fully give up the game that he you know devoted so much to. Uh, the tournament itself, I just want to mention, shout out to Kevin Anderson, who had to journey back the hard way uh, with that win. I mean, that's how hard it is to get back in, into the swing of things. That guaranteed him a spot in the U.S. Open. Good to see a guy who has made two major finals regain his form and, and prove that he can still play at his age some high-quality tennis. No, that was awesome. I'm, I'm a big Kevin Anderson fan. Uh, you know, I'm a big supporter of college tennis. You know, he went to the University of Illinois and um, – you know, got to five in the world and, and got to a couple of major finals and ha has been a great ambassador. I think he's just a good guy. I, I think his family's amazing. He's got a wonderful wife, now a child. Lady Katie, the little dog, was there on, on the, uh, the turf as well at the end of that ceremony. Um, so I was really happy to see him. Who got a, he got a wild card. And, you know, kind of like on the weekend that, you know, Goron gets a wild card <laughs> into Wimbledon, 2001 yeah. wins it, and now – you know, Kevin gets a wild card into the, the Hall of Fame Open and, and is able to take that to victory. Um, so that that was really cool. And then, you know, to see Jensen Brooks be this 20 year old American. I wanted to ask you about him because yeah, a lot of buzz. And this was the first I mean, he hasn't played much of anything and it's all been pretty good from what we've seen. There was a lot of buzz about this guy from two years ago. He's still super young, California kid and is already making an impact. And I think one of the things I noticed when I watched him play, Steve, was just confidence. It's a confident he kid out there. He does. And it was interesting because he's a big Rafa Nadal fan. And, and why? Because of how Rafa plays every single point. And you kind of see that with Jensen. Um, and by the way, Kevin Anderson is the same way in that pumping himself up throughout a match. Yeah. And Jensen is extremely vocal. And I love that. Um, he keeps himself in every point. Um yeah, he's won what 32 of 38 matches this year on across all levels. So he's won all these challengers. And then to prove himself at the ATP tour level, I think was fantastic. Um, I, I love the fact that the dude was named after a Formula One driver named Jensen. Uh, I like that he plays piano and, you know, he, he goes from from box and not a number three to, to clocks from cold play to the final countdown. And I got to shout out my guy, Steve, who, uh, runs his clothing brand, Womo Sport. Um, and, and, you know, Jensen Brooksby is like their cover boy now and great clothing. Um, and so he checks a lot of boxes for me. Uh, and, and I'm excited to see, started the year 310. Now he's in the top 30. Excited to see where he keeps going. I think with a lot of these young players, 
you know, this is just another one added to the list. We've seen Corda come up. We've seen, I mean, before that it was FAA, but you're starting to see more and more of this next generation. And it's like the next, next gen. We've already got the next group of kids that are coming up. I just, you know, it's good to see, especially, especially how he handles himself, as you mentioned. And, you know, I'm, I'm excited to see where the journey goes. Still, still a lot of, uh, of his story to be written. Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm always looking for the next Americans. You bring up Corda. I, I'm highest on Seve of, of all the, the young Americans. I think number one in the world is coming for him. Ooh, uh, like his yeah. sister Nelly just got on the LPGA. I think a major is coming for him, just like his sister Nelly got. Obviously, his sister Jessica crushes it as well. The whole family. They need a reality show. The Kardashians. Um, the mom and the dad are superstars. They're, they're humble. Uh, they're hungry. Um, I am, if I was, if the quarters were a stock, if Sebi was a stock, I would put, I would put the house on it and I would just ride it. Um, I think he's, he's going big places and that he's got Agassi in his corner. I'm a huge Agassi guy. I mean, growing up, like Andre was my dude. Um, the fact that he texts with him, like on a daily basis to get, you know, tips and he's become a mentor makes me even a bigger fan. Yeah. There's a lot of parallels, right? Like he's getting into better shape. He was working and, and improving his fitness level, much like Andre did at that exact age. And there's a lot to like with Sebi. We both have a lot of stocks, so I think we're not going to be selling anytime soon. Uh, Steve, the other big topic this week that I want to get your take on was uh, yet again, the coaching debate rages on and uh, two people that <laughs> We're friendly for the most part. And this was what I would call a good nature disagreement. We've, we've seen the opposite of that on other occasions, but since the think there's things there should be coaching every single point. Kyrgios completely disagrees. I don't want to completely hedge in the middle of this, Steve, but I think that there is a solution that doesn't involve coaching every single point while also just pushing it to the side. Are you of the mindset that coaching should be more of a part of the men's game than it is of the women's game? Or do you like how things are situated as they are? I don't think it should be in either game. I'm, oh. I'm so like, no, no, I'm old school. I think yeah. what makes tennis special is that you got to figure it out. And, um, the mental, you know, if you read the inner game of tennis, tennis is 90% mental at least. And so that's what makes the best, the best. And that's what separates good from great. And you can be an incredible athlete. Um, but if you can't figure it out, that's what makes me you know, you talk about Sebi Corda put, put, put another house on Coco Golf because she is so smart on a court and is able to, to figure things out during a match and will change her game plan depending on what's happening on the other side and isn't told about that, just figures it out because she knows, you know, her mental game is next level. And so I think that's what tennis has always been. I think that's what it should be. You have coaches, they, they you know, scout, they give you numbers, they – you can even write it down on a little piece of paper and bring it on court and look at it during changeovers. Um, I get it for TV. I, I want tennis to be popular. <clears throat> I want it to be marketable. And if coaching helps sell the sport, sure, I'm in because this is my livelihood as well. And, and I want you know tennis to, to, to move forward. But in terms of fundamentally, I'm not for coaching on the court. I, I just... I also found it interesting because Billie Jean King tweeted that she was supporting um, what Steph had to say. And then Tracy Austin, you know, our colleague, was the complete opposite of that. And so I, I, I think, you know, you got to be able to figure it out. If you can't figure if you, if you need to be told every point what to do, I mean, it's fine. If, if it happens, I'm not going to be like, oh, I, I hey, tennis. But, you know, that's not what I think our sport's about. Well, I, I agree with that part. I mean, there should not be coaching every single point, but just to kind of go further, would you get rid of the coaching at all in the women's? Like there should be yeah. no coaching visits at it's all. It's a bad look. Okay. <laughs> I don't know that I'm, I don't know that I'm fully there. I, I think that I, I think, I mean, again, it's not a ringing endorsement, but I'm Especially okay. Especially when there's like these guys coming onto the court and then it, it's just, oh, I, I, believe it. I don't think it's effective a lot of the time too. And if you, you know, you look at some of the coaching visits and then, you do run the numbers of what happens immediately after. I don't think it's always effective. And maybe to your point, it's not even really coaching. It's just like a mental break, which may or may not be good to, to have as well. I do appreciate the fact that you have to figure stuff out. You have to problem, so problem solve on your own out there in a sport that it's been said time and time again, 
you can't run out the clock in. So there's no just, hey, just roll into the, to the finish line with the lead. You have to win every point down at the end. It's an individual sport. Listen, yeah. it's, it's, it's like boxing. It's mano a mano. It's, um, th- there is something unique and special and um, old school and just, you know, warrior-like about tennis. I mean, people, I, pound for pound, I think tennis players are the, are the best athletes on the planet. And I, and I think they're the most mentally tough. The champions are the most mentally tough athletes on the planet as well. Um, and, and that's what, what separates them from others who can like call a timeout and be like, yo coach, what are you seeing out there? Tennis player can't do that. I mean, for the most part. Um, and I don't think they should be able to do that. And so, you know, I, I, I like the way it always was, but like I said, if it, if it changes, you know, it's not going to ruin my world. I just, that, that's my viewpoint that, um, you know, and by the way, there's been some really cool coaching visits on the WTA, some very entertaining moments. And I appreciate those. Um, I love how the labor cup allows that and getting to see Johnny Mack, you know, coach Kyrgios and um, coach Jack sock and, and, and have honestly seeing Roger and Rafa coach Zverev was more interesting to me than any coach coaching anyone. Um, So, so that, you know, is, is pretty special and cool, but um, you know, regular tournaments. I'm I'm with Nick. Well, it's good to see a, a disagreement online. Didn't get too personal. Love that. And I know we'll, we won't see Kyrgios with a coach for the first season. <laughs> That's right. I would love to be his coach. Um, and I won't, you know, I would just, you know, be there for the show, you know? And I, I think he, he's always yelling at his box to like cheer. I will be up. I will be, I will scream every point. You know, I'm the, I'm the vo- volunteer assistant coach for Loyola Marymount women's tennis. And so, what I love more than anything is actually being on the court and, and coaching during the matches. Cause obviously that's allowed. And you, I can literally walk on the court and tell them hit, hit down the line or hit cross court, or this is what she's doing wrong. Okay. Um, so I do, I do appreciate being a coach. Uh, and I love that aspect of it and, and, and being a cheerleader and, and providing that, you know, that passion and just that energy, you know, like, on TC, like I'm an energy guy, Mitch. So um, I want to be in the stands, just you know, giving giving all of that to whatever whoever my player is. Okay, we're making progress, coaching, leading, <laughs> energy guys. I think that's good. Uh, Steve Weissman, Tennis Channel Inside, and a couple more things with him. I mentioned Zitsipas. I mean, he's got an album now, so I didn't, I didn't see that coming. Uh, I listened to it, you know, a little, little lo-fi, some hip hop beats. Not exactly. I wouldn't exactly say it's my cup of tea, but it's probably for some people. And I think it's that bigger point that, you know, these younger generation tennis players are kind of putting themselves out there. They're trying stuff. They're, they're, they're getting into music. Like we've seen with Mutet and Shapovalov and drip drip. uh, (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Hey, there, there's a market out there and they're getting their creative juices flowing. So uh, I applaud that. And, uh, that's, that's basically, I'm not going to compliment all that they do, but uh, I applaud the creativity. I'm into it. Uh, I, I dig the night train, Chapo. Uh, I think Corti Moutet, by the way, I don't, I'm not fluent in French, but I'll listen to his rap songs. They sound really good. I don't know exactly what he's talking about, but he can flow. He's Diana Yastremska, by yeah. the way, is like, she, she's got, you know, mad bars. Um, but I, I, I like Steph. So you were like, we're going to talk about this. So I went online. Look, just listen to the the uh the titles to these tracks you got that girl from the cookie store yeah. morning cuddles <laughs> i need space for myself my journey in the quarantine era mm. we got uh winter forest more kisses I'm i like, always I'm think of you in the midnight rain i mean i just i love the titles so and by the way morning cuddles wasn't that different from you know more kisses they sounded very similar to me but it could be something that I fall asleep to. It was very calming. I could meditate to Steph's new tracks. Um, but I'm a, I'm a big Sitsipas fan. I just think he's a good dude. I like that he, you know, he's part of our Tennis Channel family with the vlogumentary um, that he does. Dear fans, hasn't been able to do a lot of that because of the quarantining and, and COVID and all that. He can't bring the film crew on the road. But he's just a creative guy. 
um, very introspective and, and I appreciate it. I like that he's doing the music as well. I love when all these players with Brooks be playing the piano, Ugo and bear playing the piano. Um, you know, we, we should have a, a I, I like the, the backhand no, no. boys. Remember when it was Federer and, and Gregor and Tommy Haas. You think we should you have know, a talent show of a contenders talent show? I would love that. I would love it with David Maybe Foster. For, I mean, it is. Yeah. Some well, I do think, talented guys. I do think though, there was a time when it was just thought of that. There's more distractions off the court that that's going to get in the way of your tennis. And that still is the case for certain activities, certain athletes. But what we're starting to see now is that these players can balance it. No problem. If anything, I think play a little better when they're getting that release off the court, when Sitsipas is able to put some time into a hobby. It, I think actually in a way helps his tennis. Absolutely. Mitch. I mean, you can't just do one thing your entire existence and then expect not to get burnt out or, um, Life, life is a is a is a journey of variables, and so to be able to find areas that you're interested in and talented in and push you mentally, I think, can only help you in every other aspect of your life. So whether that's art, music, um, you know, photography. Uh, Amanda Anasimova just started a new Instagram account for her photography. I think that's awesome. She takes some really good photographs. So. Um, I think any of these players finding something outside of tennis that they're passionate about, that they can, you know, hopefully make money off of as well um, and, and kind of get that balance. Life is all about balance, Mitch. And uh, you, can't, you can't just hit balls all day and, uh, and expect to be a, ha- a happy person. I mean, Rafa loves fish- fishing and going on his, on his yacht and, you know, hanging with the family. It's um, got to find some, some other stuff you're passionate about. Yeah, I'd love to get on that yacht, but I don't, <laughs> that's part One, of it. Get them on inside in and be like, yeah. so we're going to tape on your yacht. <laughs> yeah, it's got to be in person. You know, you can, you can put me in whatever room you want. I'm, I'm very flexible. Yeah. Uh, Steve Weissman, pleasure chatting with you. Last thing, I mean, I know the Olympics are starting, but we got some summer hard court and some clay events as well, but you're starting to see the players already look to that summer swing. If Nadal's going to play the city open in D.C. for the first time ever, the grind doesn't stop. And this is the, the chance to really set yourself up. I would think for a great summer and uh, it's already started in some of these tournaments. Tennis channels, summer in the cities has already gotten underway. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's the best because the North American hardcore season once, you know, uh, folks get back from Tokyo, but as you mentioned, already starting Atlanta, DC, one of the big three playing in DC. That, that's my home event. That's, you know, I grew up going to the leg Mason tennis classic, um, and watching Michael Chang and Andre Agassi and Jim Courier and Peter Korda uh, and Brad Gilbert and the Jensen brothers. And, you know, I got my first ever autograph from Agassi outside of a practice court there. So I have th- that tournament is near and dear to my heart. Mark Ein has done an amazing, amazing job taking that over, promoting it, getting these top players and now getting Nadal. I mean, Folks in D.C. are clamoring to see him. It's, it's already sold out. This is massive. Uh, you know, we got Murray a, a few years ago. That was cool. Um, but the, the entry list for D.C. is, is awesome. Once again, sad I won't be there. because I like to see my parents. I like to go to D.C. But hopefully we'll be going back to these tournaments in the future. Uh, blessed to be in Santa Monica, though, for it. And, um, you know, looking forward to the U.S. Open and, and, and all these events as well. And, and hoping to see Naomi Osaka, you know, back at the U.S. Open. We'll see what happens there. And then Djokovic, whether he wins in Tokyo or not, the Grand Slam is still on the line. I don't want to ever hear. I don't know. I'm going to get your take on this yeah. before we go, because I'm yeah. a huge, it's a pet peeve of mine that it is the Grand Slam, not a calendar year Grand Slam. That's the from the Department of Redundancy Department, because a Grand Slam is winning four majors in one calendar year. So you never have to say calendar year. That is what a Grand Slam is, winning the four majors. Um, are you somebody who says Djokovic can win the Grand Slam in New York? Or are you somebody that, that says he can win the calendar slam or the calendar year grand slam and i'm judging you so okay i'm pretty mellow <laughs> my pet peeve, but i would say grand slam calendar grand slam just seems too wordy more than redundant for me um i think we who do we blame for that serena and tiger woods for like 
having their Tiger Slam and Serena Slam. So now but that's have, fine. They, that, yeah. I'm fine with a Serena no, Slam. I think or that's a Tiger what started slam. the. I think that's what kind of started the. You have to say people saying calendar just to distinguish. Even Djokovic, who'd won, who held all four. But slams. it's still not. It's not yeah. factual. Like they won their own. They won four majors in a row. Well, if he's not in a calendar year. Slam, we won't have to worry about this. What's that? You know? If he wins the Golden Slam, he won't have to right, worry. Right, right. And Rand, Randy cool. Walker uh, made a great point on Twitter today because he was like, 1.5 billion people wouldn't say it's a calendar slam because the Chinese <laughs> New Year is after the Australian Open. So it's really not a calendar slam. It's for the, for the whole world. It is the grants. Anyways, I'm off my, I'm <laughs> off my soapbox now, but um, yeah, looking perfect. forward to seeing him go for the grand slam. <laughs> I can't wait to see how history unfolds both at the Olympics and then beyond a lot, a lot left, a lot of tennis left for 2021. Steve Weissman, thanks for coming on the show. And, uh, I will be, you know, holding you accountable for, uh, your boy Newsom's performance as a rookie of my Browns this year. So I'm yes, gonna, Greg hope. Newsom, the second is going to kill it for your Browns. I hope. Um, you know, Rashawn Slater is going to kill it for the chargers. So you can see him out in LA, uh, the Wildcats, we just had media day for the big 10 Pat Fitzgerald inspiring the world. Um, and I actually, I, 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 so I did NFL network last night and in those cabinets right there is my setup with all my, my football helmets. And actually, I actually, I took them down because, uh, my parents are, are coming to town and I put them back where they are in, in another portion of my house, but I would have put on one of my, my Northwestern football helmets yeah. for you, but Greg Newsom, great kid, even better, you know, uh, on the field. So, uh, yeah, I, I think you have a, a very good season coming in Cleveland. I cannot wait for that. Steve Weissman, pleasure chatting with you as always. One of the nicer guys in the industry for sure. Thanks for coming on tennis channel inside him. As always money, Mitch appreciate you. Thanks for having me. And, uh, hopefully we can do it again sometime.